There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed. And that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. They show you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash sports. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash sports. That's Indeed.com slash sports. And support the show by saying that you heard it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash sports. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. From your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a new episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and we are recording this show on Thursday night, October 19, 2023. The championship series have been very entertaining. Before we recorded this episode, the Arizona Diamondbacks just won game three by walking off Craig Kimbrell to make that a two to one series in the Phillies favor. The Houston Astros also won game three against the Texas Rangers to make that a two to one series as the Rangers were still in control, but we were recording this during game four. We can tell you that maybe a few minutes before we press record on this episode, Jose Abreu smashed a huge three run Homer for the Houston Astros. In White Sox land, some interesting tidbits we'll be talking about. Kim Ng opted out of her contract with the Miami Marlins, which shocked many within the industry. There was an offhand report about the White Sox possibly being interested in bringing Kim Ng back home where she started her baseball executive career. We'll talk about why that's unlikely. Plus, new front office executive Josh Barfield speaks and he gives clues on what the White Sox are possibly looking for this offseason as they attempt to reshape the roster. On the awards front, Luis Robert Jr. is a nominee for the American League Gold Glove in center field, but it's tough competition with Kevin Kiermeyer and Julio Rodriguez. How does Robert's resume stack up? So let's get started. Joining me is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis. And hello, Jim. The postseason baseball continues to be good. Yeah, I mean, the series themselves had been a little bit snoozy uh, with a lack of elimination games and really, um, you know, turning into full-blown series. But now with the Diamondbacks winning one, uh, showing some signs of life, showing some resilience because it looked like they caved in in game two, just kind of felt apart then you have the Astros figuring out their offense away from uh Minute Maid Park like that's all good so in terms of uh not having any favorites anymore because my World Series picks on both leagues got knocked out like I'm just in it for good baseball drama tent series going the distance and now we're starting to see that whereas uh before uh tonight or before Thursday night when the Phillies were up to nothing and 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 basically taking it to the Diamondbacks and the Diamondbacks were really slow to well I think Chase Field was sold out but like the secondary market was very sluggish like ten dollars to get in fifteen dollars to get in uh like th- that made you think like oh they're kind of just uh already waving the white flag and it was a close game almost didn't work out for him uh especially that, when that contact play uh worked against them in the ninth inning you know, as a White Sox fan, you think about that, like, well, that was their opportunity so much for that. And then they end up getting the single over the drawn infield. Uh, but yeah, now we're seeing series now. So there have been some good games, uh, some good late drama, but these big leads early have more or less made it like uh, tune in later. You know, you're counting on it not being there. And uh, now we're starting to see some games that are actually like tense early and maintain that tension uh, later into the game. Yeah, and in the middle of these series now, we're going to have bullpen games as teams really don't have dependable 
number four, number five starting pitchers that they feel comfortable handing the ball to in a postseason game. So it's going to get a little bit weird before maybe we get to game six, game seven of each of these series. And then we see the aces again, the top starting pitchers make their second appearance for a moment there. I thought maybe the Phillies would sweep the diamondbacks. That won't be the case. Maybe the Rangers will never lose a postseason game as the way that they've been playing. Um, but the Houston Astros 40 and 42 at home during the regular season, but they were the best road team in major league baseball and they love hitting in Arlington. So maybe we will get six games, seven game series after all, uh, despite on how well Philadelphia and Texas have been playing in this postseason. I've been enjoying the heck out of this postseason. It's been very fun to watch as a bystander. For the Chicago White Sox world, uh, I don't know if anything is necessarily fun, but Josh Barfield spoke. Again, he is the new assistant general manager. And there's been a few interviews that he's done. He did one with Scott Merkin of MLB.com recently and Chuck Garfine of NBC Sports Chicago on the White Sox Talk podcast. A lot of references to culture. Almost to the point, Jim, we should think about creating a drinking game. For every time a White Sox employee references culture, we take a shot. However, I think we could become alcoholics with the pace that they are already operating in. Uh, it's October 19th, and I'm over the phrase culture coming from the Chicago White Sox, Jim. Wait, does that count as a uh, a new year or the continuation from the <laughs> you know the, the calendar year in which Pedro Grafal Every time he was interviewed about the on-field product, he made references to off-field fits and culture and environments and whatnot. And it became clear, not even halfway through, that he didn't either, he didn't know how to build a culture or the White Sox just were impervious to learning how to, you know, I guess have that cultural adjustment, um, acclimation, um, was not working for them. So yeah, I, I know Barfield just got here, so I want to give him some leniency when it comes to using a word that might be <laughs> something like, no, 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 stop you. Josh, we, we heard about you. Josh Barfield. I should say uh, that that word's not a good one. Pick a different one. But uh, yeah, right now he's, he's coming from a healthy organization that, uh, you know, has done some things right and had some uh, pleasant surprises that have allowed them to be where they want to be uh, in October. And he has some adjustments to make in terms of learning exactly uh, what the White Sox aren't doing and, and what uh, words and phrases and player types uh, White Sox fans might be skeptical of. Yeah, Barfield did have something constructive to say, unlike Pedro Grafal. And what Barfield had to say in these interviews is that the White Sox are going to have an emphasis on adding players who can get on base and help defensively. It's baseball. That's kind of how the game works. But in the past, we've asked the White Sox to add left-handed powers. We pointed that out a few years ago. That was a big need for the White Sox. Guarantee Ray Field, one of the most friendly ballparks, if not the most friendly ballpark to left-handed hitters in Major League Baseball. They didn't do that. We've asked for second baseman and right fielders. Previous administration didn't do that. With the new administration, Jim, if you hear that the emphasis is going to be adding players who can help get on base and boost the defensive metrics, what makes you hopeful that Chris Getz's administration will actually be able to find those players? That is the number one question. I guess the difference right now is that Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams are gone. So you have some yeah. priors that, you know, were basically well set because like you had to see it to believe it when it comes to the White Sox caring about defense, caring about corner outfield defense in particular, um, you know, not signing players who were injured thinking that they were getting a steal when really they just might not be able to get uh, the healthy player they thought they were getting. Uh, they made these mistakes over and over again, jumping the markets for either, you know, washed players or less than savory players thinking they had a way to cut a corner there. So, you know, when I hear those 
keywords and like Andrew Benintendi would be the guy they thought they're getting last year to improve the defense and OBP. And what does he do? He has a pretty bad year in left field and he has in the second half a 299 on base percentage. Uh, partially because he wasn't hitting for any power, so hitters or pitchers weren't really afraid of him, and uh, he more or less seemed to, I'm not saying pack it in necessarily from an effort standpoint, because, like, you know, he seemed like he hustled and ran and, you know, kept his head up and everything like that. But in terms of just uh, performance-wise, if he couldn't tap into that power because of either the hand injury or the way it affected mechanics or just like uh, it took its toll on him, just wasn't mentally all there. Uh, Yeah, they did not get what they thought they were getting. So we've seen the White Sox shop for these things and not get them because they just, um, you know, their idea of a huge contract is Andrew Andrew Benintendi at five years and 75 million. So that's, I think, you know, with, with Getz here, like he had a hand in that maybe, but also like, we don't exactly know uh, what the White Sox were doing when it came to decision making. And like uh, now that Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn are gone, both of them are gone. It's a clean enough slate, like not entirely clean slate. Like they didn't power wash the chalkboard. At least they got like a high quality eraser, a new one. And you can at least see the writing on top of what was written before and what they'd cleared away to where like, I'll give Getz a chance. Don't have the highest of hopes for him, but like, If Josh Barfield comes in from a different organization and he has an idea of what speed and defense and on base percentage look like, and he looks at what the White Sox have and said, like, you guys thought this is it. Like, that's probably healthy to have at some level of decision making. Just saying, like, this ain't it. (laughs) Like, uh, what you thought you had was uh, kind of magic beans or uh, just uh, you were sold a bill of goods or you sold yourself in a bill of goods that did not actually uh, deliver the services you thought you'd be uh, getting. So um, whether that's, you know, I think that's maybe part of Chris Getz's deep dive. And the reason why, like, it will probably take years is because the talent they have on hand is not winning baseball talent. And how they're going to get it is pretty tough right now because when you look at free agency, pretty barren there. When you look at what they have to trade, they kind of need everything they have. Uh, If they want to do a quicker turnaround and they do trade somebody like when they're a few trade shits, it basically like goes into, oh, the rebuilding again, which I think everybody is trying their damnedest not to say. Yeah. The confidence again, we're all, in a holding pattern here. And that's how this off season is going to be for the white Sox. is we're, we're just going to be wait and see on what they actually do. When we hear that they want to add guys with high on base percentages, guys that could draw walks. They want to add players that could help boost their defense and acquire those types of players from the outside of the organization. Cause there's just not a lot of confidence right now with what they have on hand that it's going to get better defensively. I mean, we're talking about a huge roster shakeup on the position player side. And we'll talk about Luis Robert in a moment. You might as well find seven new players then. Maybe you keep Yohan Mikata because of the contract and you hope and pray that he could play 140 games because he could help you both on the on-base percentage side with the walks and, of course, the defense. But, I mean, realistically, if this was a video game, Jim, you'd be looking for seven new position players. You don't have the catchers. Your first baseman doesn't do these things. Your second baseman and shortstop, maybe the worst middle infield duo in baseball. You mentioned Ben Attendi and how disappointing he was offensively for the White Sox in left field and even worse defensively as well. And you're right. Like on the free agent market, this is where it's kind of hard to sell this vision right now of the White Sox trying to turn this around in 2024, this quick turnaround, Jim. The only player that they could sign that can maybe convince me that they could contend in 2024 is Cody Bellinger. Because Otani is only going to hit. He's not going to throw in 2024. Maybe he goes the Bryce Harper route and he's a first baseman. I don't know how likely that is. Uh, I'd rather have Shoei Otani at first base. I don't even know if he's ever played the position, but rather have Otani there than Andrew Vaughn. But when it comes to this mixture of we need an on-base percentage guy, we need someone to help out on defense, 
Yeah, you know, you could make up for not signing Bryce Harper, Jerry Reinsdorf, if you spend the big bucks and you sign Cody Bellinger. He's only 28 years old, entry free agency. He's coming off a four-war season. He had a 356 on base percentage. He slugged 525, and he's worth five runs uh, for run value, according to Baseball Savant. Yeah, Robert's the better center fielder. Move Bellinger to right field. Boom, you got everything covered, Jim. Everything we wanted the White Sox to address over the years. Left-handed power, right fielder that can actually play defense. And hey, he gets on base as well. Boom, That that's the solution, right? Slam dunk, go sign Cody Bellinger. Kind of. I mean, like, uh, especially you can cover center, which the White Sox needed help with, with Oscar Colas being like the primary backup to Luis Robert Jr. in center field. So he helps there as well. Like, yeah, when I was looking at the list of free agents to find out, like, who does both? Bellinger was really the only guy I saw. I mean, like, Mark Canna is there as, like, somebody who gets on base, but, like, he has a club option. Not sure if he's going to be picking it up. But also his defense isn't necessarily good in a corner, and the White Sox have a lot of sketchy corner outfielders already. Uh, Looking at the... um, uh, the team defensive charts, both on defensive run saved and outs above average, because there is a little bit of uh, discrepancy in terms of how much one system likes one player. Like when you look at defensive run saved, the White Sox were underwater at pitcher, catcher, third base, shortstop, left field, and right field, and they were zero at first and second base. So it actually liked Andrew Vaughn's defense well enough to be break even, but center field with Luis Robert Jr., the only position where they were actually uh, above average. Uh, and then, but then like when you look at outs above average for the White Sox, like at those positions, like first base, uh, they were n- negative eight outs above average by that measure. Uh, when you look at second base, they were zero. So like, that's a case where like, yeah, I guess uh, outs above average, they would be average at second base, but they wouldn't agree on first base. Third base dragged down by Jake Berger being a third and also Yohan Makata like being a little bit divisive. Uh, so yeah, center field is really it. And when I was thinking about like Luis Roberts' uh, gold glove nomination, like I was thinking like he's the only guy who is counted upon to play offense and defense. Like everybody else, like Yohan Makata until like the late season surge, like he was like, oh, at least he has his glove. Uh, like somebody like Lean Sosa being out there, like, oh, he seems to play a decent second base. Sebi Zavala, like he is a glove first catcher. Uh, left field, like Andrew Benintendi kind of gets on base, but his defense, let's not talk about his defense. And then you go around and just, you know, at best, like, Gavin Sheets provides timely hits, but you know, you're not counting on him to play defense. You forgive his defense or lack thereof. Tim Anderson, you forgave his defense until his offense stopped showing up. Like, yeah, it just, it's weird that he's the one guy counted upon to do both. There really should be more than one, even if they're not like great uh, in each regard. Like if they're not like award winning offensively or all-star offensively and not like gold glove caliber defensively I think you're supposed to at least get somebody who might be above average in terms of OPS plus or weighted runs created plus and outs above average or defensive run save which I thought they think they were getting with Andrew Benintendi but it turns out like that well the hand issue is a lot bigger than they thought and also like his defense might be bad now yeah some other names that you know, I've looked at parsing through the free agent list for those that are getting ready for your offseason plan projects. We talked about Jason Hayward in the past, but I don't know how likely he is to lead the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the Dodgers really use Jason Hayward very well with the platoon splitting. And I think the White Sox would just rely on Jason Hayward to start every day. And I don't know if he'll be able to post the same type of numbers. We're going to talk a little bit more about Kevin Kiermeyer in a moment, but Kiermeyer is a free agent, 2.2 war season, according to fan graphs, a 104 weighted runs created plus he had a 322 on base percentage, which is, which isn't like huge, but that is a big boost offensively, at least for the white Sox, as far as getting on base and defensively, he might be beating Luis Robert for the gold glove. So maybe you move Kiermaier to right field. And there you go. You greatly improved your outfield defense. And now you just have to worry about Andrew Benatendi in left field. I don't know how you feel about Lawrence Gurriel Jr. for Arizona. He's coming up with some big moments this postseason, but he had a two-war season and he's a free agent. Uh, at age 30, some guys that can maybe help you get on base, but entering the 
twilight of their careers, like Tommy Pham, Aaron Hicks. Like, there's just not a lot of interesting guys out there. Yes, they fit right into Jerry Reinsdorf's spending habits. But if you sign any of these guys, mm-hmm. they I, I could squint and see, yes, this helps the defense immensely. Yes, this hitter can help out with the walk rate and get on base. And maybe you bat them second in front of Luis Robert Jr. Give him more RBI opportunities. Like I can squint and see partial things that the White Sox are getting from these players, but really encompassing everything that the White Sox need. It's Cody Bellinger, but with how shallow this free agent market class is when it comes to position players, Jim, I don't foresee Jerry Reinsdorf having the appetite to outbid anyone. Like the Cubs could certainly use Cody Bellinger. There's already rumors that the Yankees might go after Cody Bellinger. Like he would fix a lot of things, uh, but it's just, it's, you know, back to the question of like, Mm -hmm. how can we be optimistic? How can we have confidence in this new front office? It's this really bad combination of they're inexperienced and this is the first time that they're taking on this executive role and now building a team. They were responsible for helping with player development, but now they're in charge of finding the players to add to the team. And a really bad free agent market when it comes to position players. Like, inexperience plus very few options equals what for this upcoming offseason? I don't know, but it doesn't really spark a lot of confidence. Yeah, Gurriel has only played left field uh, in the outfield, and I'm not sure if that's because the Diamondbacks have been lousy with good center field options to where, like, he's never really been a factor or even, like, right field because they have, like, Alec Thomas and Jake McCarthy and Corbin Carroll and Dalton Varsho. Like, they have, like, defensive outfielders they can trade away because they have so many of them that, like, I don't know if they just say, like, eh, Gurriel, you've been bouncing around. You just worry about left, you know, and, and so, like, with Andrew Benintendi already there for the next four years, like I don't see him fitting as much as like if Benintendi weren't around, like this is a case of like why you don't sign an Andrew Benintendi because like there are players who look a lot like him every winter uh, because they're not elite and they might have some skills and do some things better than others. But like, uh, you know, my concern with Andrew Benintendi being the big signing, we talked about it last year because you had him as like the White Sox big splash. I think I was more skeptical with Adam Frazier, yep. <laughs> but like my, you know, Benintendi, I thought was fine, but my concern was like, what does he do? Well, like what's his, what's his meal ticket? Like if things aren't going right, like, and I think we saw that this year and I think part of it's the hand injury or maybe the major part of it is the hand injury that you can point to and say like he wasn't healthy, but like, we saw what it ha- what it looks like when he's not 100%. He just doesn't have, like, a, a skill to really lean on to distinguish himself. So, like, that's why, like, it's unfortunate he's around for the next four years because, like, Gurriel would be perfect there. But I do like the idea of Kiermaier, even if, like, his OBP seems to fluctuate between, like, being okay, especially with the speed and, like, being somebody who bets ninth in the Rays order because, like, he's, you know, getting on base at a 280 clip. So, like, I don't necessarily buy into the OBP as far as him being both, but, like, if the White Sox signed him, he'd be a left-handed bat, put him in right field with Luis Robert Jr. in center, and all of a sudden, like, the White Sox can say they're serious about something, Uh, (laughs) especially defensively. Like, they're looking at, like, this is a case where, like, okay, Chris Getz, I understand that you must not have liked everything you saw. Also that like blocks Oscar Colas, you know, it makes him earn his way up, makes him like Mm -hmm. be somebody who has to like play his way into a position or like Andrew Benintendi. If he's not healthy, if he's getting on base at like a two ninety clip, like maybe that's a case where you make room for him or make room for Colas by turning Benintendi into a part-time player until he gets right. You know, if you're really looking at setting new standards and like new era of front office and you're not necessarily concerned with what the deals they signed were. You're looking at forward, you're looking forward to getting your best 26 man roster. Like at least Kiermaier would show that the white Sox are turning the page on the era of, ah, let's put Gavin sheets out there. How bad can it be? Uh, you know, Eloy Menace, he's got a DH right. except like, no, he has to play right field because, uh, <laughs> or not only does, does he, uh, can't play left field anymore because we signed a left fielder only, but now he has to play right field because we don't have anybody there until he's hurt or like, you know, winces every time he runs at max effort and can't be out there anymore. 
So like, that's why I think Kiermaier would be good, even if it's a case of like either the White Sox having to overpay, you know, in quotes, uh, or they're not at the right part of their, you know, contention window to really maximize the signing like him. But at least it would signal that uh, Chris Getz and whoever else he brings aboard thought the way the White Sox previous way of doing business was unacceptable. That's a good point, Jim. And we'll talk more about Kevin Kiermeyer and Luis Robert after a quick word from our sponsors as we shift focus and take a look at the American League Gold Glove situation with the awards as Luis Robert Jr. and Kiermeyer are nominated. When I saw the Milwaukee Bucks make that big trade with Portland for Damian Lillard, I immediately went on game time to see when they were playing the Chicago Bulls. Saw so it was on November 30th, and game time had great seats in the 300 level right at center court in the United Center. Great tickets at a great price. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. Buying tickets shouldn't be stressful. Use game time to purchase your tickets. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee helps eliminate stressing over tickets. If you find tickets in the same section and even row for less money, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. That's why Game Time is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country. Download the Game Time app, create your account, and get $20 off your first purchase using our promo code SOXMACHINE. Terms and conditions apply. Again, create an account and use our promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first ticket purchase. Game Time. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. They show you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash BlueWireSports. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash BlueWireSports. That's indeed.com slash blue wire sports and support the show by saying that you heard it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash blue wire sports. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. We'll go back to the Sox Machine podcast. Like we mentioned, shifting focus over to the Gold Glove nominees for the American League center field spot. Luis Robert Jr. nominated along with Kiermaier and Julio Rodriguez of the Seattle Mariners. And Jim, I really enjoyed the breakdown that you did on SoxMachine.com in the column. I highly recommend it if you guys didn't get a chance to read the column. As I thought, Jim, looking at the advanced metrics and looking at the way that how people vote and, of course, the defensive index, which plays a factor in who ultimately wins a gold glove when it comes to defensive runs saved, Kiermaier, amazingly, 18 runs defensive saved for Kiermaier in 2023. Luis Robert was six runs. Julio, Julio Rodriguez was negative five. But when you look at like fielding run value and outs above average, Rodriguez did score really well. Rodriguez actually scores higher than both Kiermaier and Robert with a defensive index, which I thought was interesting. And when you look at fielding run value, if you go to StatCast or BaseballSavant.com, Kiermaier and Robert tied for the lead of all American outfielders at 12, and Rodriguez was a distant third at nine. For a long time, though, Jim, I thought before the nominees were made that Robert had a slam dunk chance in winning this award. But I think I've come around the conclusion that you made in your column that it's probably Kiermaier's gold glove to lose at this point. Yeah, just because, like, you know, the Sabre uh, defensive index only counts for about a quarter of the votes or the, the the balloting points and the rest are votes. And I think Kiermaier, he's won three gold gloves. And the only thing stopping him from winning more is, like, he's he's been injured for a couple of years. Also, some years where that OBP has been, like, 280. He's been platooned more, so he hasn't had the playing time or innings that other center fielders have had that cost him. Um, yeah, maybe 
some spots on ballots or maybe even in the case of like a, a couple of years ago, like not making the, the finalist round at all. So like now that he's played a full year, he was a threat offensively with an OBP you mentioned. Um, and the metrics, like he's got the counting stats, not only like the per 150 game stat or per 1200 inning stat, which is uh, often how he's distinguished himself when he's been more of a part-time player. Now he actually has like the counting stats as well uh, with the outs above average being like, as you mentioned, top in the American league among outfielders, uh, defensive run saved like a monster. <laughs> I think like Fernando Tatis Jr. Is he like one of the few in right field who's provided as much value, but like among center fielders, like he stands alone, man, he yeah. can help. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and that's a case where like, if Kiermaier won it, like no shame losing him. Rodriguez, like I would think that Robert's, uh, defensive reputation is a little bit higher than Rodriguez, but, um, really there's no shame in finishing anywhere on this ballot. I think being a finalist is good enough, especially like when you look at, and I mentioned this, how Robert played last year when you had the vertigo and, COVID and wrist issue and, you know, groin issue just had all these you know, minor injuries and illnesses that lingered and the White Sox didn't manage him well. And he had some weird breaks in the outfield and drops and like really uncharacteristic mistakes. He didn't play the wall well, like the, the warning track posed problems for him in terms of timing leaps and like when to pull up and when to, uh, you know, play the carom. This year, like he seemed to master the wall. He seemed to uh, play that really well, like knowing when to leap, knowing uh, you know how to brace himself crashing if he had to like run into it. Like he had going back, especially like, going back into his right uh, down pat. And so like the fact that he's, you know, that progress has been reflected in a gold glove finalist. Like that, sh he showed what he needed to show, which is like, being a stellar defensive center fielder, which makes you forgive like all the weeks here and there where his strike zone gets too big and he swings himself into bad outs. And, you know, the reason why he's not like a superstar offensively, but when he's a superstar defensively, that raises the rest of his game to where like, yeah, he's an American league superstar who should be an all-star should be in the home run derby should be a national name. And the white Sox really should support him with players who are complimentary uh, because like he shouldn't be expected to do it all himself. And back to the conversation we were having before the break, Kiermaier signed a one year, $9 million contract last year with the Toronto blue Jays. So at age 34 entering his age 35, this isn't a long-term investment. So let's say Kiermaier does win the gold glove here. I think there could be some multiple teams would be interested in adding someone like Kevin Kiermaier, but as he enters his mid thirties, is that a starting role? Is that a platoon situation? Is that coming off the bench here? If Kiermaier were to win, it'd be kind of weird to be a four time gold glover and center fielder, a center field, and then be like, Hey, Kevin, uh, we'll give you $9 million, but we need you to play right field. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> this situation. Cause you know, Robert is much younger than Kiermaier. Yeah. And it's his position too. And like, they're both great. <laughs> like it's not, uh, yeah. And Robert's like yeah. a, an everyday player, uh, you know, knock on wood. Uh, but like he played 145 games. If he's healthy, he'll be in the lineup. Whereas Kiermaier might need to be uh, platooned. So I think if you want stability in the outfield and you want like a quarterback in the outfield, then Robert would be your everyday guy. But Kiermaier would allow like Pedro Grifol to rest Robert if he's less than 100% or less than 90%. If he needs like a day off here or there to rest an injury. So you don't get in this weird, like we have to play him because we have nobody else. Um, I can just imagine for, you know, one year, 9 million or some kind of uh, reprisal of the contract he signed with teams thinking like, he's not going to be like a three thirty on base guy because he's been a two eighty on base guy in previous years. Like we don't want to give him too much of a raise because I, you know, we can't necessarily count on him. You know, you don't want to pay him for past performance necessarily but I can see like the White Sox like I'm thinking like two for 24 is kind of a number that jumps out to me like if they were going to try to win a bidding war it'd probably start there like two guaranteed years and have to be like eight figures and the White Sox would have to sign them knowing like 
this is probably not going to amount in a winning team. Perhaps this is a case of we can sign him and then look to trade him. Like, it, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, in if he's not really liking the situation he signed himself to and it's just like he liked the money but not anything else, like maybe he gets traded deadline or after the winter. Uh, or, you know, maybe he has like a no trade clause to where like he just can't be dumped off on anybody. Uh, but uh, I think it would take something like that for the White Sox to sign him and move him to right field. But I would just take interest at this point and not being like, November rolls around. Yeah, I think Oscar Colas is going to be a guy. We're not going to make any effort to block him or make him earn it. We're going to go with him and Gavin Sheets and Eloy Jimenez backing him up. Like, I want the days of that to be over because uh, that hampered the White Sox basically in three consecutive years. And they managed to skirt it by, like, signing Brian Goodwin who's a real outfielder, even if not a very good one. Like they were able to, because of injuries, have to kind of patch together an outfield, but actually mix in real outfielders along the way, which helped. But then like we saw it in uh, Tony La Russa's second year, we saw it last year, just where not having good defenders eventually causes chain reactions elsewhere and makes relievers who are, you know, maybe not majorly caliber look worse, or maybe who are only medium guys asked to pitch in high leverage look worse or make, uh, fifth starters look like spot starters, like, you know, just on and on and on. So I would just take interest in like any kind of reflection that the status quo is not acceptable in many regards. And if this is like a multi winter or acquisition period project for the White Sox to, be taken seriously both by fans and free agents, then so be it. But I think the work in that regard has to start now. I think we've sold ourselves that the White Sox should sign Kevin Kiermeyer. Uh, <laughs> but in November, when the offseason begins, I'm wondering if any other Gold Glove nominees or even winners are going to be Trey Targets, Jim. Like, that's, again, working off this clue that Josh Barfield provided. They want to add guys who can get on base and they want to add guys to help out defensively. Uh, again, the White Sox don't have a lot to trade, but I'm wondering if those are going to be some of the guys that the White Sox are going to be targeting. It it really does sound like, yeah, slugging, if we could hit for power, sure, but we really need to get on base and we really need to improve on defense. So that seems to be the White Sox goal for this upcoming off season. Kevin Kiermeyer helps, especially on defense. Uh, Cody Bellinger helps with everything after that in this free agent market for position players. There's not a whole lot. So can't wait to see your guys' off season plan. Projects. Matt Chapman is about the only other one, yeah, but offensively, and you on yeah, offensively there. though, it comes and goes. Yeah. But defensively, you know what you're getting. Like, and he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that gives him that high floor and elite skill that even if he's not hitting, he's doing something. Right. I mean, he could be, he could be a platinum glove winner, Jim. Matt Chapman. Um, yeah. You know, he's right there with like Nolan Arenado at third. So, yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the outlook right now. But I, I do find the clues to be helpful. So hopefully that helps you guys as well. Again, with the offseason plan projects coming up for Sox Machine. The final topic before we sign off on this episode. So again, we mentioned the intro and it's been talked about quite a bit on SoxMachine.com in the comment section and all across social media is it really surprised people earlier this week that Kim in leaving the Miami Marlins and it stems from this conversation that she had with owner Bruce Sherman. They were not on the same page and the Marlins were very quick to send out a press release when the news was initially tweeted out uh, by Craig Mish, uh, very dependable source when it comes to all things of the Miami Marlins, that it was Kim Ng that opted out. It was not the Marlins firing Kim Ng. They wanted to be clear on that. Well, of course, she gets her chance to speak to reporters and makes it known that her and owner Bruce Sherman were not on the same page for this upcoming season. And that's when she decided to opt out. And then we learned through the grapevine that Sherman wanted to hire a president of baseball operations. Since Bruce Sherman bought the team in 2018, Jim, he had Derek Jeter as a minority owner, supposedly running baseball operations. And Jeter left that position last year because according to Jeter, Sherman deviated from their original plan, which they 
pitched to the other owners of Major League Baseball to convince to hand the franchise over to Bruce Sherman as the majority owner and Jeter as the minority owner, even though it was pretty clear that the Marlins were not going to be spending a whole lot of cash uh, in the first few years under Bruce Sherman. And then when it was time in the PowerPoint presentation, according to Derek Jeter, to start spending money, Sherman didn't want to spend money. So Jeter tells everyone that's why he leaves. Here comes Kim In. Hey, I just helped build a team to make it into the postseason. Yeah, we didn't win any postseason games, but we got there. And now you want to hire someone to oversee me? Deuces, I'm out. Now, David Sampson, uh, <laughs> who has a very interesting tie with Jerry Reinsdorf. Uh, he's the former Marlins president. He told front office sports that Jeter was actually fired by Sherman because Jeter failed to meet revenue goals. And Sherman was not involved in baseball operations decision making when Jeter was when Jeter was there. But honestly, between Derek Jeter and Bruce Sherman, who do you want making baseball decisions? Yeah, you want Derek Jeter to make those baseball decisions. So you have this really weird situation going on in Miami, Jim, that Bruce Sherman, an owner, does not want to spend any money, deviating from the original plan that he made with Derek Jeter, and now he's lost both Derek Jeter and Kim Main. Now there's this vacancy, and I don't know about the momentum that they have built after reaching the postseason. And then you have this whole situation going on in Boston right now with the Red Sox opening that nobody wants to take the job right now. After firing Heim Bloom, like their initial targets are turning down job interviews. They're not just turning down the job. They're not even interviewing for the job. Now, it does sound like from the Boston media that there is some headway being made. Uh, the Red Sox are planning on interviewing Minnesota Twins general manager Thad Lev- uh, Levine uh, for the opening of President of Baseball Operations within the Red Sox, which could be an interesting decision uh, and impact a team in the American League Central. But when Jerry Reinsdorf announced the hiring of Chris Getz, every one of the White Sox world, we didn't like the timing because we all knew it was not a flushed out process in finding the next key baseball decision maker. If Jerry had waited, Jim, now there would be some more interesting names available to help out on the baseball decision making. But there is this report from the athletic that maybe possibly flimsy idea that Jerry Reinsdorf might consider bringing Kimming back to the White Sox to help oversee Chris Getz. You wrote about it earlier this week, very unlikely after you had some time to simmer and a lot of discussion on SoxMachine.com in the comments section. Do you still feel like that is highly unlikely that the White Sox are bringing Kim in now? Yeah, I think highly unlikely in all regards for all parties like the White Sox after stressing single decision maker and then hiring Chris Getz as the single decision maker. Then you bring in Kim Eng, who... Uh, would be another decision maker. Would she be the single decision maker? Would Chris Getz, uh, yeah, well, she wouldn't be because Chris Getz already made some decisions in terms of who he's retaining, who he's bringing aboard. So like, yeah, some, it, it will already be a joint decision in terms of the staff that's already there. And then who knows who reports to who. So it doesn't make sense there. It doesn't make sense for her necessarily because like she just left one, organization that just uh you know tried to basically fire her by getting her to quit which is basically what they did like it allows the marlins to try to dodge blowback from like firing a general manager who just got to the postseason uh with a team that has been starved for postseason opportunities not to mention the first uh female general manager in baseball first uh east asian uh general manager in baseball. So like, like there's that. So like, you know, it's going from that situation to a situation where the White Sox are kind of lost right now and trying to find their way. And part of the reason why was because they had all this convoluted chain of command. You can't count on Jerry Reinsdorf, uh, keeping one, uh, and, and keeping his word and not meddling himself. So like, why would she want to go to a team that might need a couple of years to understand what the hell it's doing? Uh, like that's why I think like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And like, I don't know why Chris Getz would agree to it or cooperate with it because like, he signed his job, like say what you will and how unproven he is like, but he signed a deal thinking he'd be the guy. So like, I could understand if like, wait, what the hell? Why do I have a boss now when I was supposed to be 
the boss or Jerry Reinsdorf was supposed to be my only boss. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And like, if it's going to be like a type of uh, job where she looks for an advisor role, kind of like what John, John Daniels is doing with the Rays or what uh, Alex Anthopoulos did with the Dodgers in between calling the shots for the Blue Jays and then the Braves, like usually do that with a good team, like a team that will win some uh, division titles or win like 85 games and it keeps your name good and fresh and attached to a winner. And the White Sox would not, not be that. So like, yeah, I don't see Ng working out. Like what I think I'm more fascinated by is the idea, like if the White Sox didn't, if, if they like waited or like did the whole due diligence with interviewing people, would their search look a lot like the Red Sox in terms of people declining interviews or declining the job if they do go through the interview process and are offered because like, you know, with Boston, it seems like the, nobody wants to get in between John Henry and Alex Cora. That's kind of my read on it based on the fact that Cora has already retained himself and he's already like, I'm coming back next year. Like, okay. So if he's suspected to be the guy who didn't like Chaim Bloom, or if he has designs on front office work himself somewhere along the lines, like you kind of take that job feeling like, you know, you might have a, uh, uh, a target on your back if things don't go well, or if you sign a player that he's not using well or, or what have you. So like, that seems like the, the source of tension there, but like the white Sox have their own chain of command issues. And like, it seems like my, or at least my hope is that like Pedro Grifol has been forced on Chris Getz, even though like Getz is saying like the right thing. I just think that Getz, you know, Reinsdorf is like, I like Grifol well enough. I don't want to pay two managers deal with it because like, I don't think anybody thought Robin Ventura was the guy after a few years and he had to serve until the end of his term. So we've seen like Jerry Reinsdorf, stick to a manager all the way through. And it wouldn't surprise me if like Griffol is under the same pressure here of just like, uh, he's good enough. You can do better with players like, and, and just like kind of leaving them hanging out to dry a little bit. So that's what I'm curious about is like, if the white Sox, I wish the white Sox did go through the process just to understand, like, how do they compare to another seemingly toxic job that has meddling both above and below and see which one's better because like the white Sox at least don't have Boston like expectations that make losing records unforgivable. Like they, you know, it's, it's a case where, uh, uh, you can, uh, kind of feel around for a while to understand where you might be going before like Jerry Reinsdorf actually cares about like how the team's actually doing and how many fans they're actually drawing, what kind of TV ratings they're drawing. Yeah. In these situations, Boston, Miami, even for the White Sox. Like we talk about who is going to be that decision maker in as as acting as president of baseball operations, but I think it's pretty clear owners, at least some of them in this league, are wanting to follow the Jerry Jones playbook. Uh, of course, Jerry Jones owns the Dallas mm-hmm. Cowboys and he also acts as the general manager. Like, I want my hands in everything. I, I want my hands in the baseball decision-making process here. It's my money. Why wouldn't I have a say in how you're spending my money on what type of players? The problem with that is Henry Sherman, Reinsdorf. I mean, Henry's won some world series, but he had really smart baseball people that were taking care of that while he was building his sports conglomerate, right? Buying the Red Sox, buying other sports franchises around the globe. Sherman has already kicked out Derek Jeter, who helped him win the bidding war for the Miami Marlins. Uh, and now he's seemingly on an island down in Miami. And Jerry Reinsdorf's 87 years old. Like Chris Getz has no experience negotiating with agents or doing these presentations to sign free agents. None. Who is helping Chris Getz with this work, Jim? Because Josh Barfield doesn't have that experience. Jeremy Haber. Oh, yeah, I guess Jeremy Haber. Sure. We might as well have just made him the general manager. 190 man. page presentation on Pedro Grafal. God. Yeah. Yeah. Way too many pages. You could have just gave me a page uh, in hindsight. No, it's just like Jerry Reinsdorf's going to have to get involved. And there's some agents that don't like working with Jerry Reinsdorf. And Jerry Reinsdorf has made it very clear he doesn't like working with some agents as well, including the most prominent ones in the sport. It's just, 
yeah, I mean, we talked about at the beginning of this episode, like how can you have confidence, like the White Sox, new front office members, at times they say the right things and, you know, they're giving us these clues of what they want to aim for as far as like a quick turnaround here, but there's just still so much uncertainty. And if you're trying to build hope coming into this off season with an inexperienced general manager and an 87 year old owner in Jerry Reinsdorf, it's not a great combination, but as you've always pointed out, Jim, the White Sox problems are not unique to themselves. And there are other teams in this league that are seemingly going down the White Sox path. I do not recommend that. I strongly don't recommend going down that path. But after what we've seen in Miami and what is going on in Boston, I guess the White Sox are not going to be alone when it comes to front office dysfunction coming soon. And there's always the Rockies. Uh, uh, Yes, of course. We can't forget about the Colorado Rockies. So, yeah, I'm. I'm with Jim. I, I think it would be, I think it would be a great move if the White Sox did hire Kim in. I think it would go a long way in trying to restore some confidence between the White Sox and let's just say the media and fan base. Uh, it's just, just not a lot of confidence. Everyone behind the scenes, even in the media circles, talks about how it's weird that how Chris Getz got this job. But I, I'm with you, Jim. I don't think it's likely. Yeah, I think there's a baseball discussion to be had with like Kim Eng if there were actually, you know, any smoke or any fire to the smoke. Um, Just because like the Marlins aren't in a great position. They got to the postseason with a negative run differential. It's kind of weird how they did it, maybe unsustainable. So like there are some baseball questions about how well she did with free agents um, and, you know, whether the farm system has enough to contribute to help patch from within so on and so forth. But like, before I even get to that, it's just more a matter of like, uh, it's a case where like, she is better than Chris Getz because Chris Getz has shown nothing. It's Chris Getz. It's always a favor to Chris Getz to compare him to anybody who's done the job before, because you can say like, well, Kim Eng failed. Chris Getz hasn't, uh, you know, just because he hasn't done anything. So like having a seat at the table, you know, kind of like a, somebody who wants a debate from somebody who's prominent in their field, like, uh, and, and being like, no, you shouldn't debate that person because that person knows nothing. Uh, you're giving them the stage and you're giving them uh, gravitas by association. Like, so you like comparing Kim Eng to Chris Getz is like, no, it's Kim Eng's better. So like, you know, she just, you, you have more faith in what she can do because even if she's made mistakes, she might have learned from them. Whereas Chris Getz might have to mis- make mistakes his first time to make uh, improvements. So like, that's why like it's, it's already a tough enough comparison as it is. Uh, but it's, you know, if the order were reversed and like White Sox hadn't hired anybody and Kim Eng was on the market, like I'd say, sure, uh, contact her, see what she's got. Also, you know, compare her against other candidates, uh, kind of see where they're coming from, what their histories are, what organizations there might be better candidates than Kim Eng, but like, they're all better than Chris Getz at this point. And that's, what's tricky about discussing it. But I think as long as Chris Getz got there first, the White Sox more or less made their bed and anything else right now would be making the same mistakes that leads you back to a Kenny Williams, Rick Hahn, who's in charge discussion that nobody wants to have anymore. I will miss those conversations, though. We had it for 10 years, Jim. 10 years we had those conversations. Yeah. I'm, I'll am i miss the jokes. Like, <laughs> I do like, you know, being able to fire off, like, you know, I, I want to know Chris Getz's verbal tics just because, like, it was always fun to go with the Rick Hans, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, uh, so I'm, I got to pay more attention to what Chris Getz does and doesn't do and how he fills time and, like, the, the, in the not too distant future, like Rick Hahn would say, or, you know, augmenting the roster, et cetera. Uh, like all the things he loved to do to buy time and to not answer questions. Like, I want to know how Chris Getz goes about that. We've heard a little bit, but I think, you know, as he signs players, as he deals with rumors regarding specific players or specific positions, like I want to know uh, what he does, how he says things just so we can get back to making the kind of jokes that turned out to be pretty prescient just because it really was a swap out the year, swap out the free agents, but Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams will make the same mistakes. You know, it's funny on social media, especially on Twitter, uh, the sandwich accounts, we used to make fun of the sandwich accounts because they would post 
crazy White Sox rumors, but sometimes they were true. Uh, so you have to give them some credibility. Mm -hmm. The idea that these are obviously burner Twitter accounts from White Sox employees uh, that want to float things out of the media, like not front office executives, but employees in other departments and just hearing things at 35th and Shields. Uh, the sandwich accounts. Friends of what but 23 or Katy yeah, Perry's exactly. booty hole. The sandwich accounts have been quiet, Jim. So I'm kind of working with this conspiracy theory that Rick Khan was one of the sandwich accounts this entire time, like right under our nose. He was tweeting out things and <laughs> we never, we never figured it out. So, uh, yeah. And like him saying like how much he hates White Sox Twitter or how much he hates, uh, uh, social media and such. And like, yeah, it's, that's the perfect crime. Well, it is isn't most it of is his, uh, crime. most of his employment was a crime, but it's a different <laughs> <laughs> it's a slightly different consideration. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Everything's going great in the White Sox world. Uh, continue watching the MLB postseason folks. We'll have a new podcast episode for you guys on Monday. Uh, we'll have a little bit more further conversation about the outfielders on uh, our coming episode as we'll review the outfield and catchers for the White Sox. There'll be more conversation about the whole catching position because I think that's another area of need everyone will have to talk about. When it comes up to this offseason, I do not think it's a good idea that the White Sox roll with Carlos Perez or Corey Lee as a starting catching uh, starting catcher for the 2024 season. Again, we'll have those conversations in our next podcast episode for this upcoming Monday and see where we are as far as a World Series matchup in both the American and National Leagues. But thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. If you just discovered the show, you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. We also upload our podcast into our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Socks Machine. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel there. You can also follow us on social media. We're on all the platforms now at Socks Machine. You can follow me there at Socks Machine underscore Josh. If you enjoy our work and you want more, you can get more by becoming a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash Socks Machine, where our Patreon supporters get exclusive content. They also get ad-free versions of both the podcast and website. We're going to be having our annual town hall in which Jim and I meet with the Patreon supporters and have a presentation a little behind the scenes of how things are going on the media front and the website front and some of our plans for the upcoming year in 2024 uh, so they are patreon supporters again thanks for their support they help keep the lights on and they get some insight of what is upcoming from sock machine so if you are interested in signing up you can do so at patreon.com slash socks machine monthly plan start at two dollars or you can save with an annual subscription the socks machine podcast is a production of socksmachine.com you're over all things chicago white Sox baseball and part of the blue wire podcast network alongside jim margulis i'm josh nelson Thanks for listening and watching.